if it is necessary for like let's say in the case of a surgery or something mm -hmm. um, after the, the the antibiotic course then you know just eating the fiber if you've depleted those if you've killed off those beneficial bacteria often called commensal bacteria that are producing all these compounds mm -hmm. short chain fatty acids included if you kill it off and you you know it, it, eating dietary fiber only can do so much right so what about repopulating it with the bacteria itself, probiotics, foods that contain probiotics, mm -hmm. are there ways that you think are better than others? Yeah, so th this is something that really hasn't been explored experimentally in great detail. The best way to recover after some major perturbation, whether it's antibiotics or preparation for a colonoscopy or food poisoning, you know, diarrhea or something like that. And um, so I think, you know, the um, if you look at, at trials that have been um, performed um, probiotics certainly have a place in recovery from these major perturbations. It's clear that um, probiotics either in supplement form or in fermented foods, things like yogurt, can actually shorten the duration of uh, antibiotic associated diarrhea or make it less common in, in people taking probiotics. And so this really suggests that the probiotics are doing something beneficial. Now, um, that mechanism isn't well understood, but um, it's, I think, fairly well recognized that these organisms that you can buy as supplements or you find in fermented foods um, don't take up permanent residence in the gut typically. And, um, but they do do something as they're passing through this community. It's known that um, they can be viable, they're alive, and they can actually have interactions either with the microbiota or with the host immune system. And, um, and so I think a nice way to think of it is just using probiotics as placeholders. While your microbiota is recovering, using those organisms that are present in fermented foods, for instance, um, can actually help to prevent pathogens, bad bacteria, from taking up residence during that time. Right. I, I've read a, a few studies with a probiotic called BSL number three, mm -hmm. which um, I use myself. Uh, I, I definitely use it if I have to take a case of or a round of antibiotics, but um, it, it's got like 450 billion mm. bacteria, which is like 10 times more than anything else on the market. And if you mm. think about it, you, you take a probiotic, not to mention it comes shipped cold, you know, so a lot of these probiotics on the market I think also are uh, dead. Mm -hmm. They're dehydrated dead mm -hmm. bugs. And um, so, you know, there's been like 25 or so published studies I've read, both clinical trials and also animal studies where I've seen, you know, it, it's actually effective. It does increase certain amounts of uh, commensal bacteria, it does lower inflammation. In fact, it also increases brain-derived neurotrophic factor in the brain, so it's having an effect in the brain. Mm -hmm. um, but, but I did a personal trial myself where I took BSL number three for 30 days, mm -hmm. so I, and I measured, um, well, I didn't specifically measure it, I used Ubiome, a company that allows you to send in a little sample of your poop, and they'll tell you what sort of mm -hmm. bacteria are in it. And so I did this before and after my 30 days of BSL number three, and I was very interested to see that I was expecting just to have an increase in some of these commensal bacteria that were in the, the mm -hmm. probiotic. But what I found, to my surprise, was that I had new strains of bacteria that weren't identified previously cropping up. Hmm. And I'm not sure if that's because the commensal bacteria were making more of these compounds, which were feeding other mm -hmm. types of bacteria that couldn't be detected, and now they're, you know, they're flourishing or what. But um, I was, that was sort of surprising to me um, to see. But I think that, you know, in terms of recovering from something like antibiotic use or even people that have, you know, inflammatory bowel disease or colitis, you know, eating these fermented foods, eating the fiber, broad spectrum fiber, and, you know, possibly doing, doing a round of the VSL number three hmm. uh, may be a good, good thing to do uh, after any sort of procedure. Yeah, you know, I think it, your story is really interesting for, in a couple respects. So um, the first is that I, I think it really reinforces this idea that we have this complex ecosystem like a rainforest inside of us. And you can imagine that adding a bunch of new species at high numbers to a rainforest um, doesn't just result in those new species being there, but could lead to an entirely different chain of interactions and ecology that would um, crop up over a certain period of time. And so um, it's not hard to believe that you would see new species 
species flourishing in the presence of these new community members added at high at high numbers. Um, I think the other thing to be aware of is, and and I think you're insinuating this with with talking specifically about VSL number three, um, that the, you know the. Um, the supplement market is a mess. It's not regulated. There are a lot of really poor products out there, um, many of which don't have um, the viable organisms that they suggest they have on their label. Many of them don't have the, um, the actual species uh, that they say that they do on their label, or they have contaminants that are present. And, um, and so I think it's really important if people want to go the route of probiotic supplements to make sure you go with a company that you trust. There are um, independent uh, organizations that can verify the contents of probiotic supplements. So USP is a symbol that you can look for on probiotic supplements as an independent verification of, of the contents, not efficacy, but of the contents. And, um, and then I think, you know, fermented foods are a really great way to go just because you get this diversity of microorganisms and we really don't know um, which ones are best, which ones are best for different individuals. And so it really requires that each person take kind of a personalized approach to this, become systematic in testing what appears to work well, be compatible with your system and um, isn't causing um, uh, problematic side effects. And, and so that's just kind of a, a, a personal journey that each, each person has to go on. No, that's, that's really a good insight and advice. Um, another thing I wanted to just touch on briefly, because I know that you guys have talked about uh, something that has to do with um, the, the origin of our microbiome and you know, starting from when we are born. Um, so I'm not sure actually if you guys know about the development of it in utero at all or if it's known at all how that you know works in terms of what the mom's eating or doing etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, so starting from conception in utero development to um, you know giving birth can you talk a little bit about the that and the you know development of the microbiome yeah so I think for many years it was largely thought that the you know, while, while the baby was still in the womb, that that was a largely, uh, an environment that was largely devoid of bacteria. And now there's starting to be some new studies that it looks like maybe there are some bacteria in the, um, in the amniotic fluid, but it's clear that even if, even if that pans out to be true, that, um, that these are not major contributors to the initial colony that, that forms in the, in the um, newborn infant. So when you're born, you're born with your gut largely sterile. And what happens at that point is, you know, there's this land rush by microbes to colonize this new, um, this new habitat. And what, what we've seen is that children, depending on if they're born by C-section or vaginally, will have a very different initial microbial community. So children born vaginally have a gut microbiota initially that looks more like that of their mother's colon or vagina, whereas children that are born by C-section actually have microbes in their gut that are more the types of microbes that we find more on skin and not necessarily the mother's skin, maybe the doctor or nurse's skin. And so, you know, that initial colonization is dependent on, on the method of birth. But there's all these other things that happen initially in a child's life that can really dictate how the community goes. So whether a child is breastfed or uh, formula fed has a huge impact on the microbes. And so you know this is this is the baby's diet, and diet we know is the basically you know one of the major levers to control this community. So babies that are fed formula, their microbiota looks very different than than um, breast milk. And actually, what we see is breast milk has a component of it, one of the major components of breast milk is this type of carbohydrate called human milk oligosaccharides or HMOs. And for a long time it was really a mystery why those molecules were there because we knew that humans can't digest human milk oligosaccharides. So why would a mother put so much effort into creating these compounds and putting them in her milk if her baby can't even digest it? Well come to find out it's actually the gut microbes that are digesting these HMOs. So in breast milk there's not just food for the baby in the form of lactose and fats but these HMOs that are food for the baby's growing microbiota. So the mother's feeding the baby and also her baby's growing microbiota. And these HMOs are very specific for human milk and so far have not been able to be replicated in formula. And so that we think is a large reason why the communities are so different. 
And then, of course, antibiotics. The average American child is on a round of antibiotics every year, and we know that that's a huge, um, makes a huge impact on, on that growing community. So all these things that happen early in life could really set a child on a trajectory potentially for having um, potentially a very good, healthy, robust microbiota or potentially one that, that isn't as good. And so I think as parents, especially of new children, we need to be very mindful of the choices that we make early in a child's life because many of these microbes that we have by the time we're, say, the age of five, many of these microbes will be with us throughout our entire lives. So we really want to get that community started in the best possible.